So we um, went through it, and then um, the last couple uh, application of CL uh, is one is uh, based on the syngas generation for liquid fuels production based on fissure drops. Again, um, you'll get a, uh, some of these developments in the Wiley Ware um, if you have subscription to it to your university library. But let me just tell you what it is. Um, it is um, the rest of the Fisher Trops unit which looks at um, production of liquid fuel at a very high pressure. Um, but it um, requires the production of the syngas. So the syngas can be produced um, uh, from fixed bed gasifier or otherwise. And um, while this part is conventional flu, uh, conventional fissure troughs, this part, this part can be construed as the uh, chemical looping based syngas generation, where you have the normal reducer and the normal air reactor. So normal reducer uh, fuel reactor as well as the air reactor, iron based. Um, so it makes um, hopefully the, um, the syngas production a little bit less complicated than, um, than the fixed bed or otherwise. But uh, it can be, it is predominantly suited for, um, suited for natural gas. You wouldn't like to do it by any other, uh, for any other feedstock. And then the last bit, um, uh, let me talk about um, the sulfuric acid production or the application of chemical looping principle for the sulfuric acid production. And um, the way it currently happens is this scheme in here. So that you actually have a drying tower. You have a drying tower then you have solid sulfur coming from somewhere which melts it and it melts at about 150 degrees centigrade solid sulfur becomes a liquid then it goes to a furnace where the air the dried air uh, becomes converts it to sulfur dioxide and drying is extremely important otherwise you will produce um, uh, sulfurous H2SO3 uh, over there, which you can't, uh, which you want to avoid, and then um, this is an uh, exothermic reaction, whereby you um, extract the heat to generate power for inside uh, operation, inside uh, production rather, and then the dried SO2 and cooled uh, to about 400 degrees centigrade. It then goes to what we call the converter, uh, where um, uh, predominantly uh, it, uh, it is actually a catalytic process together with uh, the, the, um, the uh, steam coming through the absorption tower, then goes and converts it. And then eventually here you get sulfur sulfuric acid but part of it uh, part of it is also can also be produced here so that that can either go back in fact it does go back uh, as a recirculation uh, arrangement and then the rest goes into the final absorption tower from which you get 99.7 percent purity sulfuric acid. So this is roughly what it is, how it is done at present and different um, technology suppliers have different, different ways of doing this one um, and also doing that one. So that's where the, the, the variation in these two reactors, that's where the, um, uh, the uh, different technology developers, they differentiate themselves so that they can get their own IP. So the, this bit is the furnace which uh, uh, converts the liquid sulfur to sulfur dioxide. So let's keep that in mind. 
So that box can now be um, uh, replaced by a chemical looping based operation. In the previous one, that is about 1100 Celsius. And here, of course, the complexity is that you have two, um, two uh, reactors. One is a fuel reactor where sulfur goes as a fuel, as the going from solid to melted to as soon as it goes in here. About fuel reactors are almost always uh, 900 degree. It becomes gas. And then, um, where is the? Um, um, okay, so you haven't shown the metal oxide. Maybe should have. Anyway, so it, that has not been shown. So the uh, here, the sulfur oxide, it doesn't require any um, uh, separate oxygen to go inside here. Air is sub, uh, given to the metal oxide, the reduced metal oxide in here, and uh, then the reduced metal oxide can uh, up gets oxidized and come back and do it again. So there at the end, you get very high purity sulfur dioxide. So the, essentially, the furnace is being replaced by the looping uh, reactors. Uh, rest are very conventional. So is the furnace apparently which is a major source of problems and it goes to higher temperature about 1100 Celsius or so. Here technically you have uh, you can do it uh, at 900 the the enthalpies work, work quite well but the uh, downside is that instead of one single furnace you now actually have two reactors even though technically they will be smaller and the advantageous position is that it um, it has goes into lower temperature. So what are the perceived temperature advantages of sulfur dioxide production using chemical looping principle? One is that the, it is the more concentrated uh, um, stream of sulfur dioxide whose goes to the converter in here as opposed to about 10 to 11 percent. So the converter now becomes a lot um, more compact, uh, higher partial pressure, therefore reduction in the capital and the operational cost. And someone has actually done the calculations, the technical economics of it. Heat recovery equipment located in the non-corrosive air atmosphere. So the all the heat uh, recovery e equipment, if you can now see, are no longer in in here where it was getting exposed to full sulfur dioxide. Here it is um, getting the heat is recovered from the air reactor, which is um, technically sulfur dioxide free or less concept, lot less concentration of sulfur dioxide except for the leakage. And then um, in here, the other thing is um, in, the, in the waste heat recovery unit, you can actually generate hot air, which can uh, uh, can then go and get um, mixed to reduce this temperature to the same temperature that you need in the uh, in the uh, conventional one. So, in a way, you are not touching this bit at all, but you are sending more concentrated CO2, not 11 percent, but 18 percent. And the other thing is in the conventional furnace, which uh, operates at 1100 degrees Celsius, because of the higher temperature, you have the NOx production, which is a problem. Um, therefore, in here, because it's a 900 everything, and air can be staged as well if you want it to, then uh, the NOx production is a lot less. Then you also have the reduced need for the drying tower. And of course, you have the increased electricity production. So these are some of the uh, perceived advantages. Um, so what are the um, uh, metal oxides? Metal oxides are uh, iron based. And uh, this can be mounted on alumina support. And uh, 
they are um, known to be, iron oxide is known to be more sulfur tolerant than anything else. The uh, iron oxide and alumina both are sulfur tolerant, sulfur dioxide tolerant. So, the metal oxide that you is cheap uh, inexpensive iron oxide and it is uh, known to be sulfur tolerant also. And the it has a reasonable capacity to donate oxygen. Um, uh, there, are, there is a group in Italy who have done uh, uh, some of the um, uh, measurements on oxygen donation capacity and it is more than what you can get with in presence of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. I mean the in presence of the coal volatiles compared to that in presence of uh, sulfur dioxide it is more. Why? Mechanistic uh, information is still non-existent. So, the now that they have patented it I am sure they will do it. Iron oxide does not attract very much. Um, it is mechanically more stable. Uh, quite stable and uh, this is the size that is uh, that is uh, used as the metal oxide. Acid gases are not formed, uh, iron sulphide pyrites are not formed and sulphur dioxide has not been detected so far because of the loop seal arrangements etcetera um, in the air reactor outlet. And oxygen carrier to fuel ratio is important uh, so that uh, it to ensure that the major stable species is sulfur dioxide and not hydrogen sulfide. So, uh, and obviously the stoichiometric ratio maintaining stoichiometric ratio of greater than 1 is not a problem. So, so these are some of the um, important things and therefore, but the fact also is not everything is um, known and known to be positive how many times you can recycle the iron oxide, the recyclability and the long term reactivity of the iron oxide is still unknown. Okay. So, these are some of the unknown issues. So, what are the design issues um, uh, uh, still to be, so it is, it is a relatively new concept only about couple of years ago. For storage of what? Sulfuric acid. Oh no, I think they use specially lined vessel for sulfuric acid storage. And in fact, for that matter, I don't know. I don't know. Could be Teflon. I don't know. No. Now, carbon steel I, th I think you will not never be able to tolerate uh, corros corrosive gases or corrosive liquids for a long period of time. It has to be um, uh, a special uh, steel with lining and but that will be no different to what is currently practiced. So, the only point I am making is that um, here you are um, replacing the furnace which operates at 1100 degree centigrade and the heat exchanger units are heat extraction units are all in the furnace which is full of corrosive gases. Here it is different, here temperature is lower, here um, uh, the heat extraction is not from the fuel reactor, here heat extraction is from the air reactor where corrosive gases are not present. So, those are some of the perceived advantages apart from iron oxide being known to be sulfur tolerant, sulfur gas tolerant. So, that is uh, what is so, so, so what are the design issues still it is a relatively new concept. So, uh, still a lot of unknowns um, design issues are um, design issues are uh, that uh, the uh, of course, CFB is the ideal reactor for the fuel uh, EM, uh, fuel uh, reactor optimal thermal integration between these two air reactor and the fuel reactor is most important. Oxygen carrier has to be capable of 
transferring heat from the exothermic air to the endothermic air, which is not of a problem because we know that is possible. Solids conversion in the fuel reactor has to be greater than 35 percent. So, that is the most important thing. In order for this to be viable um, in the energetically, the uh, conversion of the sulfur dioxide, sorry, sulfur gas to sulfur dioxide has to be greater than 35 percent. Whether you can achieve that in a uh, particular uh, reactor day in day out that remains to be seen. Of course, you can design it uh, for achieving greater than 35 percent uh, conversion of the sulfur to sulfur dioxide, but design is one thing and then proving it continuously is another thing. Uh, so, air needs to be preheated to about 400 degrees centigrade that has to be recognized, but there is sufficient heat within the system to allow that to happen. Solid circulation rate between the two reactors, um, uh, one important point that I make by reading all of this is that the um, uh, it is below the upper limit that is established for commercial scale CFBs. So, the commercial scale CFB combustors that you can buy and commission and then operate, they are known to operate within a certain solid circulation rate. And here as you would expect the fuel reactor should have uh, a circulation as well of the uh, metal oxides between the fuel reactor to the air reactor and then eventually back to the fuel reactor. There is no uh, carbon stripper business here because it is no coal, no natural gas etcetera, but the circulation rate which determines that energetically that enthalpy wise the heat from the air reactor will go fast enough into the fuel reactor that is possible because that is not beyond the boundaries established for commercial scale coal fired CLPs. So, that experience is there. So, it can it is not a out of the box design that you are looking at. Hmm. Otherwise, um, uh, there the amount of heat that needs to be carried by the metal oxides through it into the fuel reactor it will be a lot more. So, and also for sulfur dioxide sorry sulfur liquid sulfur to get converted to gaseous sulfur and then give you the reaction you need that amount of uh, temperature. Okay. Yeah, but the uh, no the the thing is enthalpy wise there is sufficient heat within the system. It is how you extract it so that you can use all of it inside without requiring continuous heat supply during steady state operation that is the key. During the startup obviously you will have other ways. Uh, you will obviously start it up with natural gas for example. But once it is started up, you would like to not to continue with any external gas supply to keep the um, uh, temperature sustained. Here, you don't need it, but you still have to design it in such a way that it is it it does. Okay. So, so the comments that I make is that thermodynamically the chemical looping based scheme for sulfuric acid production is feasible and that there are series of perceived advantages, but of course like anything uh, you know long duration demonstration is really the key to establish the true techno economics. So, still a long way to go long way to go. So, that that actually concludes my presentation on this module uh, chemical looping. Uh, what I have done is I started with the conventional chemical looping combustion for coal or solid fuels. Then knowing 
then sharing with you the knowledge that we know so far, our own and others. We then have, I then move to the other potential applications, which some of these are, uh, I have shown, and, um, and left it at that. Now it will be the task of those of whom who are interested in chemical looping, or in general in that area, to think of any other applications, whether any other applications are possible or not. So, so uh, that's basically it that I wanted to talk about chemical looping. So, do you have any comments or any questions before I move to the next topic? Yeah, natural gas ones are a lot easier to work with, but. Correct. Correct. For the startup you are talking about. Yes, absolutely right. Sustaining on natural gas is also an option. So if CO2 capture from obviously chemical looping has a lot of um, lot of um, in the sense that it is less complex. No, there are uh, now uh, people have taken already IPs, I mean uh, patents. People have taken, uh, companies have taken uh, patents. See, taking a patent is not, uh, if you have money, it's not a difficult thing. So that you protect your territory. You can take the draft patent, uh, sorry, provisional patent on a concept which may, you may have only proved at that scale so that you can keep the provisional patent for one year. During that one year period, you make further improvements. And after one year, you have the, you have the option to either uh, discontinue the provisional patent because you haven't made any progress or if you don't have money or both, uh, then others can uh, take it up very, very quickly. And some companies do that. But the other option that you have is if you are sure, then you can take the full patent, which will be quite expensive. But it is worth if you see that there is a value. So for example, in one of our uh, work, from one of our PhD students' work on um, um, levoglucosinin production, um, which is a very green solvent from biomass, uh, we proved, the student proved the concept uh, in this scale. Yeah, in that much of a reactor. So we took the provisional patent. And then when the student submitted his thesis, he has got his PhD now, we, we then, uh, then Monash then decided that we'll take the full patent because we'll continue with the continue with the um, development of it to make it um, continuous flow. That comes at a cost, but that's a judgment that uh, the university makes or the industry, parts, uh, industry partners make. Um, the industry partners did not want that to happen, but Monash, we decided that we will make, uh, go ahead with it. So we are now developing it simply because no one has been able to show that it can be made from biomass at a large quantity. Um, so we have been able to prove it, but now we are building a continuous plant. Uh, it sells at about $10,000 a kilogram, so there is an incentive to continue <coughs> with the development. If it was 50, 60, 100 dollars a kilogram, then, then there would not be any incentive to, uh, you know, go ahead with the development of it and taking the full patent. So it's a decision that you make. Anyway, coming back to this uh, chemical looping before we close it off, um, I would uh, encourage you to think of this principle and then any other application that you can think of either in relation to your current work or in relation to any other work uh, that you can imagine doing 
side by side. Uh, we encourage that to our students so that the students, of course, they do their main PhD work, but to some of the students, we also give them to do um, some additional work, very exploratory, knowing well that they will, it will not be going to their PhD work because it's not directly connected, but there is a strong upside and the st student is capable and the student is also willing to do the additional work, either computational or experimental or both, so that we can get the work done that way. And, um, and then it might open up a uh, new opportunity. So a couple of students, uh, my students are now spending time in uh, US and Japan for six months each. And um, they are coming back with new knowledge that they gathered over there. But uh, they will be, uh, essentially they are diversifying their own research knowledge base, not necessarily everything that they are doing there will go into a chapter of their thesis, not necessarily, but they are the ones who are opening up new frontiers for us to carry forward the, um, carry forward the research in different domains. So I encourage you all to do that as well. Surely you will have your own thesis, but this is also the time where you can have perhaps additional time to, to far, uh, leverage against the knowledge that you, advanced knowledge that you are gathering through your PhD or PhD is nothing but an advanced knowledge, right? But rather than limiting yourself just to your own PhD work and writing a thesis and a couple of papers and getting the degree, uh, this is also the time to open up the thought process, think of many other things uh, as many as you can manage without jeopardizing your own thesis work and then um, go forward. Not for everyone, but definitely for, definitely um, worth thinking. So that's basically it. So let me now move on to the next, the second last topic. I'm not sure if I have kept it or not. Maybe not, I will keep this one tonight. So, So the next module, the second last module, it has got two parts. One is essentially a collection of um, other people's work as, uh, is the, as it is in the, um, as, as it has been done uh, in the overall workshop. Uh, we are essentially, I am essentially summarizing the work that is available in the literature for your benefit. And uh, that part of it includes my own work or our group's own work. But, so this is no exception. So the first part is all about other people's work. Second part is all about uh, one of the students who um, just submitted his thesis, has gone back to India, uh, and then will come back um, on the 28th to work on a different project. Um, so his work will be the second part of this. So this one is about coal stroke seam gas to CO2 to products. Um, um, technically from coal, you can make many, many products. Because coal is carbon, so you can make carbon fiber. Um, coal is carbon. So you can make graphene if you want to. At what cost? That's a different thing. Okay. Then from coal, we have seen you can make um, um, we can make um, syngas. That reminds me, I should also drink a bit. Good. Otherwise, I will fall asleep. So, um, so from syngas um, also, you can make a whole lot of products. 
And uh, more and more, focus is shifted to make products from CO2. Um, uh, because CO2, if you can capture CO2, but then the question is, what do you do with that captured CO2? Of course, you can think of storing it underground, but that's only limited. Not everywhere, uh, everywhere you will have CO2 storage spaces next to where the CO2 is generated. Unfortunately, CO2 storages are not next to the coal-fired power stations or the natural gas-fired power stations, right? So you really have to think uh, what do you want to do. So one option is that part of the CO2, by all means, um, not all, part of the CO2 uh, can be stored, uh, can be utilized to make other products. The products can be, um, um, you know, polycarbonate. You know what is polycarbonate? Uh, the polycarbonates are the transparent material that you can put on the, yeah, plastics. But it's polycarbonate. So essentially, if you have carbon dioxide, you can make polycarbonate. How you make it, that's a different thing. And how long will it last, that's a different thing. But at least it's, it's, it's a way of utilizing the CO2 and they're storing it away. So we have a PhD student um, who, for the last one year, has been working in that area. But by no means, we are the only ones in the world working in that area. Then um, from CO2, you can make all sorts of products, and we'll see. Okay. Then the other thing is that um, of course, CO2 also allows you to be used as a gasification agent. Now, that's only temporary use of it because it will eventually come out as CO and then eventually come out as CO2. And it's only a limited amount that you will be able to circulate. So at steady state, there will be, next, there will be a net generation of CO2 anyway. So it's not quite a CO2 utilization on a large, uh, so on a long, longer time frame, far from it, right? Uh, then, and also when it when we talk about CO2 utilization, um, CO2 is a very stable molecule, very stable molecule, as you know, and it's a low energy molecule, right? It doesn't get excited at room temperatures. So in order to um, activate it, you need high temperature, and you need lots of high temperature. But you can remove, you can reduce that activation energy barrier by catalysts. That's what catalysts do, right? Catalysts simply lower the activation energy requirement. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you want to convert CO2 into products whether that's liquid fuel or gaseous fuel or solid fuel even, solid carbon, you need to fall back on catalysis. No other option. Nothing else will, um, will work. So catalysis. And when it comes to catalysis, catalysis can be homogeneous catalysis, can be heterogeneous catalysis, can be photocatalysis, can be biocatalysis, can be electrocatalysis. All sorts of things possible. So let's take one by one. What is homogeneous catalysis? Does anyone know? Okay, oh, that's easy. Oh, then everyone knows. Good. Then let's not go into the heterogeneous biocatalysis. Okay, so here the catalysts are enzymes. So uh, decidedly, they will um, the the uh, they will work only at low temperatures. The enzymes will all die at high temperatures. Rate is generally slower. Correct, absolutely correct. Very good. Um, then you have the um, photocatalysis. So it is the light activated. Uh, catalyst 
but then you need a proper surface for that to happen. Um, the light has to be, the photons have to be uh, absorbed and then uh, made uh, available to the CO2 to, to activate that molecule and then do whatever you want to do. So that's photocatalysis. And then electrocatalysis. Hmm? Yeah. True, true, very true. So uh, with the help of uh, electricity, uh, your electrical charges, you are um, trying to get the, um, uh, get the molecule moving. So these are the predominant form. So we, um, we will, I am not sure whether time will allow us to go into the electrocatalysis and photocatalysis or not. Yeah. True. Oh, far from commercial, yes, and that's why that's why a lot of development work is going on because technically, uh, sorry, potentially it can be a very, very low expensive option. So for photocatalytic cleaning of wastewater, photocatalytic cleaning of the windows, when you have a long multi-storied, tall multi-storied uh, buildings, cleaning the windows from outside is a challenge. And there are um, self-cleaning photocatalytically active materials or, uh, that can be applied to the glass uh, before it is mounted, which will keep it clean all the time, particularly when um, sunlight is available. Huh? No, you are not. So, how do you compare the relative performances? Eventually, it will boil. It does boil down to economics, really. So, if something is l less efficient, then you will have a large reactor. And if it is a large reactor, then you can calculate what its cost going to be, capex going to be. Uh, you can make an estimate for its OPEX. So at the end of the day, the comparison would be not strictly on efficiency basis because you can't compare on the efficiency basis. It will be all based on uh, economics and nothing else. So, no, actually, ruthenium is a no is a uh, known um, uh, uh, heterogeneous catalyst. So there are applications where ruthenium is currently used uh, because you all you are looking at um, one to two percent loading at most, and if you can load it very very well and you can actually recycle it, recover it, and recycle it as well. So that's not an issue. So ruthenium, but it all depends on the application. Uh, not every, for every ap application, you can think of using ruthenium, or that, for that matter, indium, et cetera. Um, they will, and molybdenum. Molybdenum is uh, somewhat cheaper, uh, more abundant than ruthenium or uh, indium. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, it is more ab abundant even compared to cesium um, um, or um, uh, cerium, uh, either way. So, the, uh, so biocatalysis is still at its infancy, so we are not going to touch here. Uh, and photocatalysis and electrocatalysis, not my intention to go into it. Uh, because it's a very highly specialized uh, topic, extremely specialized topic, and with beyond my level of knowledge. I, my intention is to put a very good review paper for your uh, sake and nothing else. And um, 
I will concentrate more on the heterogeneous catalysis, uh, which is very well developed, which is more of what I know and I practice. And given that 95% of the catalysis work in the world is centered around heterogeneous catalysis, it makes sense to concentrate on that a little bit more. Okay. So that's the rule of thumb. And the heterogeneous catalysis market is growing like anything. The last figure I saw was annually about $40 billion. Because every, anything that you can think of in the petrochemical industry relies on heterogeneous catalysis. Any chemical. Hmm? Yes? Um, um, simpler. Not simple. Uh, it has its challenges. Uh, yeah. So I will actually show you why. Yeah, as compared. To, um, homogeneous catalysis is practiced in a, it's very special cases. In the um, in, uh, the example that we gave uh, for levoglucosinone, which we have patented, they taken the full patent. Um, it's based on homogeneous catalysis, but very very rare uh, to see large-scale applications of homogeneous catalysis, um, except for very high-value products. Okay, so on that note, let me bring to your attention this message that I got last night. Um, it, um, it appeared on July 11, today is July 18, so a week ago, but, um, but I, I got the news only last night. From, um, from a site that I subscribe. So in UK, the Tata Chemicals are uh, going to build a large scale CO2 capture uh, utilization plant. So they're not talking about CO2 storage, not CCS, CCU. And I have given the link, or if you just type in Tata Chemicals CO2 capture, you'll find it. CCU, yeah. So uh, it's what? And if the Tatas are investing, then they see a value. You know, they are extremely focused, and um, they don't like to spend uh, as some of the other uh, companies uh, really nearly check. So, yeah. <laughs> so. So let's um, stick to the heterogeneous catalysis bit, and uh, let's uh, come to the syn gas front. And um, so there, um, what you have seen it in umpteenth times, uh, but given the focus of this workshop, it makes sense to bring it up again. So we have talked about this gasifier. We have talked about a little bit about air separation, a little bit, but not much really. Heat recovery, steam generation, we know syn gas cleanup, we know. Um, but this uh, and this are not something that uh, we uh, talked about, but we know it generally. But this is something we haven't talked about, that, um, that uh, you can have a uh, very good um, industry around the utilization of the syn gas to number of chemicals. And, um, but then in, in chem any chemical reaction, you will invariably, you will have um, multiple products. Even if, you, even if you are, even if you take the simplest example of C plus O2 giving you CO2, it will not be 100% CO2. You will get tiny amount of CO will get tiny amount of the other things which are to, uh, invariably comes. So the point I'm trying to make is that every chemical reaction has its um, desired product and its undesired product. That's the nature of chemical reaction. So that's why in chemical, uh, uh, chemical engineering, uh, the separation is actually a big part. In fact, it's a standalone unit 
uh, standalone subject that uh, everyone, uh, every university teaches. The separation of the products, gas from gas or gas from solid or solids from liquid or uh, liquids from solids, uh, etc. Or vapor from liquid, we, you know, know it. Uh, so separation in itself is a very good, uh, very important area. Uh, because uh, depending on your products desired not so that the reaction can go into the forward direction and then can uh, give you uh, what you want. So, so this is the one that we are going to focus now a little bit. So let's see. Let's stay with um, the syngas. Let's not worry about the gasifier. So let's see that, think that the gasifier has produced you given you uh, syngas after gas cleanup, etc., etc. Okay. Let's not worry about the gas cleanup anymore. We assume that's done deal. Um, and then uh, it can then you can if your ratio is not good enough, then you can shift the yeah the gas. And um, and then with um, with the help of iron or cobalt catalyst. You can convert that to through the Fischer Tropsch process into alkanes, alkanes so like methane, propane, etc. Et alkanes, you know, alkane, alkene, etc. Or um, um, with the help of um, uh, the hydrogen, you can also get into that path. So then you have the other path. Um, I don't know. Whatever, whatever, whatever your gasifier gives you. If the ratio is not good enough for the project, for the product that you want to make, then you have to uh, tweak the ratio. And how can you tweak it by using shift reaction? So the point I'm making is that if you have these syn gases, then possibilities are uh, abundant. Uh, you can make alcohols and there you may need certain kind of um, catalysts, iron or cobalt or uh, ruthenium or rhodium etc. So um, and or um, uh, which is um, uh, very popular uh, with the help of uh, with the help of copper oxide or zinc oxide. Uh, as catalyst, you can make methanol. Okay. But in a, all of these products, CO and H2 in different ratios are the ingredients. And then you have to have the catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis, to go to either this product or that product or that product. So, so we assume that's done. Someone is giving you nice thin gas, clean off everything. And that's our starting point for this particular module. Without catalyst, they won't work. Hmm? No, they, they won't give you any products, which means there won't be on, only, in, only in place of uh, catalyst, only in presence of catalyst. Yes, 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 yes. I don't know. Anyone knows? Is methanol cheap in this country? Yeah. So, so what's your point? Don't talk about methanol. <laughs> I think one or two slides later you will get an answer to that. That here all all what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Methanol. Me no. 
So, so we, uh, for example, in Australia, we don't allow more than 10 percent ethanol to be blended with petrol. But, but that's only. Uh, the, but then you get uh, 10 percent less mileage from your car anyway. I have done that, and that's what I found. So either way, it's a good social responsibility. You feel great that uh, for um, for your normal running, you are not emitting that much CO2. But if I have to, I have to do about uh, you know 1,500 kilometers per week, regardless of whether I put the ethanol, 10% ethanol, or that or that, I will be spending the same amount, emitting the same amount of CO2 anyway. Okay. So, so that's basically it. So, anyway, but no, that's nothing. Not all is lost, though. What what, what we are saying in here is that if you have the syngas, predominantly carbon monoxide and hydrogen, at different ratios, then you have different possibilities to make products. And once you have made methanol, which you say quite rightly that it is cheap, then you can make more expensive products from methanol. What are those? One is acetic acid, which sells uh, to, uh, six or seven times the price of uh, uh, methanol. You can make, make formaldehyde. Uh, you can make uh, DME, and we'll see how that is made. And you, will make, you can make also dimethyl carbonate. So, so the possibilities simply increase. Nothing is cheap in the world. Not necessarily. If only if you have a bifunctional catalyst. Uh, what is a bifunctional catalyst? Maybe I will talk about it. So, hmm? two two different two different no, not two active size. Uh, bifunctional means okay. Uh, one is um, in methanol. When you get, you also have water in it. If you take the remove the uh, water catalytically, because you can't just sponge it out, then you get DME. So um, you can from going from here, going from here. Going directly from here to here, bypassing that, is called a single part synthesis. Uh, 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 one of my students he finished his PhD on exactly on that topic, and uh, but that means what you do is you um, uh, have a catalyst, you develop it, uh, which has two functionalities. One is methanol production functionality, the other one is dehydration functionality, all in one. Then only you can do it in a single reactor, if you have a catalyst which has bifunctional capability. No, I think, no, I think you are talking the same thing, so do not change yourself. You can convert here. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I said easily though. Whether I said easily, I can't remember that. Anyway, so you can also make DMC, and we'll see where these are actually used. Okay. But on top of that, you can also have. You cannot get just CO and CO and hydrogen. You obviously you have CO2 in the syngas, unless you have, in some miraculous way. You have cooled it down, separated the CO2, and then um, uh, left only with uh, uh, CO and hydrogen. So what can happen is, if you also have CO2, then you can, with the help of catalysis, all routes here going to any product, anything to anything, is all heterogeneous catalysis driven. Okay. 
So if you have CO2 in the syngas, that means CO, hydrogen and syngas, then also you can go to methanol, and from there you can go to DME, but also uh, you can go directly from uh, CO and hydrogen and CO2 to directly to DME as well. Okay. So the possibilities are there, and then you can also have additional uh, possibilities that um, instead of uh, just going to methanol or instead of going straight to DME, you can also go to dimethyl carbonate. So those possibilities are there. So uh, do you ask anything? No. Okay. So um, so so this is all summarized in here. Sorry. Any pressure required? Oh yes, nothing will happen at atmospheric pressure. I can do that. Large pressure. Yeah. How much pressure? They all know it. This side is the catalyst people. <laughs> yeah. So anywhere between thirty to fifty bar is really. Yeah. So that that actually is uh, you have alluded to a very important point, that you have to compress the gas to that level, which means the clean syn gas has to be cooled before you can con uh, uh, sorry, compress it to that level, otherwise nothing will happen. So if you take a certain ratio of CO and hydrogen and just try to give it with the help of catalyst and temperature at atmospheric pressure, nothing will happen. They will simply go in, go out. But as you go for force pressure onto them, because they need it to be, these are very, very stable molecules that we are talking about. They need a fair bit of, you know, they are the bad kids. Hmm? Just because of, uh, some like like bad kids, you know, they need to be smacked. These molecules also need to be smacked with pressure. Otherwise, they will not activate. They need high pressure, high temperature, and on top of that, they need catalyst. Molecules. No, we need to activate the molecules. I don't know. You decide how you will give the heat to the uh, to your reactor. So this is your reactor. Okay, you're putting in CO from this side, CO2 and hydrogen from this side, and you're giving them at high pressure. So they have gone in. They have gone in. Now you you are talking, and inside that you have kept catalyst right from the beginning. That's possible. Now your question is, how do I give high temperature to them? Right? How do I? Huh? How much temperature is desired? So how much temperature is desired? Anyway, because if it is too high a temperature, then you have got problem. Usually 250, 300, 400, not much more than that. So, have you answered your own question to some extent? See, what will happen? What? Uh, what temperature does CO2 and CO and hydrogen condense to liquid? Cryogenic. So it's not a problem. So this is this is we are talking about well over two. Where is the moisture coming from here? Okay. Okay. So um, so you assume your starting point is the moisture of a dry syngas. Okay. Dry syngas is what you are assuming. <laughs> I 
Right. <laughs> Is it? But it's not a reaction when you, when you are condensing it well below the reaction temperature. There is no, no there is no more uh, concept of uh, equilibrium. But okay, so shift. So okay, so shift reaction has produced what? CO two and H two. Now, technically, not technically, really practically, you can condense the water vapor out and you can get whatever you are getting, right. So, it will be dry gas, you can, you can literally get your dry gas, that is not a problem. Your question was that I give, I know how to give it pressure, I know how can, how to put the uh, catalyst, how do I give the temperature. There will be a lot of uh, sections inside an integrated plant where heat will need to be extracted. That heat can come back uh, here. If it cannot come back in here, bad luck provide it with electrical heat. Or, or design the uh, reactor in such a way so that, so that inside the jacket you pass uh, clean hot flue gas. So, heating a pressurized reactor is uh, not that of a problem. Okay. Uh, what type of compression systems? These are not high value, high um, throughput. So this will be mostly reciprocating compressors. It will not be centrifugal. I can't imagine a centrifugal. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. So any other questions? These are reactions. These are serious reactions taking place at high temperature, uh, taking place at high pressure, uh, moderate temperatures, 250, 300, 400, etc. Uh, no condensation because the products are still going to be pressurized liquid or whatever. So, no condensation really. Okay. So, so in the in here, what we have shown is that the gasification, whether it is done using coal or liquid fuels or natural gas or biomass or waste, that really opens up the possibilities for many many products formation, and uh, and these are the many products, and even you can extend those products to make other things as well. And this is practiced. This is not, um, uh, for example, urea is made exactly in this way. Okay, um, uh, you can, you make um, acetic acid um, in this way. You can make um, mono, what's MTB, um, butyl ester. Yeah, so that's actually a fuel additive, gasoline additive, MTB. Uh, DME. Oh, that I don't know. Maybe uh, this obviously is gradually being phased out. Uh, but the point I'm making is starting from here, and everything that goes beyond that, as uh, so that so such as the gas cleanup you can actually go to all of these products or extend to take it to other products. Okay. Uh, so, let us let's talk about a little bit of your um, concern that you had that methanol is very cheap then what can you do with it which is true. So, what we can do is we can uh, make the uh, dimethyl carbonate or make it uh, may convert it to dimethyl ether. And if methanol is made from the renewable biomass, renewable sources such as biomass, then it is even better. But you know, this analysis process, they will not know where the carbon dioxide and hydrogen and CO2 
need to have come from where they come from Bama, so we can get a little bit of 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 a little bit
diabetes in all its colony had the oxygen there. So, so you are not relying on external oxygen, external air, or the function. So you, you, you have that initial Little bit endothermic, and the, it will, by the time the bonds are carboxylic bonds are very weak bonds, very weak bonds. By by, but two three hundred degrees they will break. But two three hundred degrees pyrolysis will not be complete. Uh, coal will not even ignite. At, And, and that part, part which is not released as part of this carboxylic group, that's what is giving you the, uh, that, that's what is giving you the energy, exothermic energy. You are getting two advantages. One is you are not requiring to supply that much oxygen from outside, which is a saving in pumping cost which is a saving in heating cost. Okay. So it's a two-edged sword, really. But you are losing some of the carbon at, as carbon dioxide without contributing to exothermic reaction quite early. That's, a, that's the um, trade-off that you have to have. Okay. So any other question? No. So let's move to the next bit. So, uh, so one example, uh, so we have shown we have seen these possibilities, and we have seen uh, these um, three different compounds that you can make uh, from methanol. Let's now um, uh, also discuss what are the um, what are the other constituents that you get from gasification, and what you can do with it. Other constituents from gasification are, of course, methane, and at the same time, you have. CO2 also, I think, right? Uh, so the dry reforming of methane, that means without any presence of water vapor, uh, you can get um, CO and hydrogen. And if you have CO and hydrogen, then you can do all sorts of things. So you can have uh, the methane can come from natural gas, the methane can come from biomass, or methane can come from coal pyrolysis as well. So uh, that's one option, dry reforming of the methane to give you uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. But also, if you have the carbon monoxide and hydrogen in a different ratio, uh, then uh, you can have uh, with the same, um, same, uh, same molecules, uh, you can actually have the methanation reaction going. Uh, that means you can, uh, uh, sorry, if you have CO2 and hydrogen, uh, then you can actually form methane. Okay? And then we know the classic uh, Bordeaux reaction, uh, which is ex uh, reversible. And then you also have the decomposition of the methane to uh, solid carbon and hydrogen. All of these, these are all. 
um, in a way, utilization of the products from gasification. Okay. Utilization of the products from gasification of coal or biomass or petroleum coke or any uh, hydrocarbon material. And all of this happened um, at very, very high temperature. Some of them are exothermic, some of them are not. And the sort of catalyst that we use are the nickel, uh, nickel and um, magnesium oxide, nickel mounted on MgO or nickel mounted on um, magnesium aluminate. Uh, You know, sometimes you need to make, not suit really, I mean, you can actually generate solid carbon and then, and, then, and, then, and then actually sell that solid carbon because for graphite electrodes and all, uh, you do it that way. It's not suit formation really. You actually get the structured graphite. Graphite is a very well, graphite is not suit. Even though it's um, it's a it's carbon, but it's not soot. Huh? That's a bit of an extrapolation, uh, not quite to that level. But graphite is very important. Graphite is a very good electrode, and then pe people are trying to scavenge graphite from the lithium-ion batteries. Uh, there is a competition going on between universities worldwide how in a um, uh, less energetic manner you can take the graphite out from the lithium ion battery. It's not easy. The lithium ion batteries, are, it, they have lithium. And lithium is very, very, hmm? yeah. So uh, it's not easy. That's what people are working on. It's a very big research area. Yeah, lead acid cells and all. Yeah. Because now we are all talking about circular economy. The, so that uh, not not that that's the way forward. Uh, but then uh, that comes also as a cost because it will not be energy neutral. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Has he bought tea or not? Uh, if he hasn't, then I will continue. Eh? Nothing. So let's continue then. Okay. So I'm trying to give you a bit of a, um, a bit of a background on what's the current uh, current areas of research and development are. And uh, that the uh, once you do the gasification, your possibilities are possibilities are enormous. Then you have the reforming of steam and uh, reforming uh, steam reforming of uh, methane or dry deforming of methane. Obviously, if it is um, steam reforming, you use steam. If it is dry reforming, you don't use steam. You have still have to use another reactive agent, which is. Carbon dioxide is a good reactive agent, and we know what temperature carbon dioxide can act as a uh, reactant from boardwork reaction. Below 800, nothing happens. Okay. So, what the purpose of showing this is that um, these are all producing CO and hydrogen at certain ratios. In the in the in the uh, first case, uh, it is producing um, one is to three. Okay. Uh, but if, if, you, if you can somehow combine these two in a single reactor, then you get the by reforming. That means you have the methane and the CO2 bulk together, then you can get um, one is to two, and then you can get your methanol. And if you get methanol, we know that we can go to some other products too. Okay. Um, and but the point I also would make is uh, they will need uh, certain types of catalysts. They will need uh, quite high temperature, and um, uh, and also they will need a good pressure. Uh, anything under five bar will nothing will happen. Uh, five and five bar will be too less. 
uh, around 30 bar you will need the biggest problem with uh, steam deforming uh, sorry the methane deforming or hydrocarbon deforming is that um, as soon as the molecule becomes activated then you start depositing carbon or soot whatever you call it on the catalyst surface and if that happens then the catalyst gets deactivated. The catalyst gets deactivated by several ways. One is because of the presence of the polluting species. If your gas cleanup is not good, then hydrogen chloride or hydrogen sulfide, etc., or ammonia, etc., can go in and then it can um, um, passivate the surface and make it, uh, make it uh, you know, uh, less active, uh, deactivated. Or the, the major form of um, uh, deactivation is actually the deposition of the carbon uh, from the hydrocarbon onto the catalyst surface. But if that happens, you can find it. When you see that the, uh, it's getting deactivated as your product concentration uh, decreases, then what you do is um, uh, you inject steam and that steam will eat out the living. Okay, nice meeting you. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, and no, no, that's fine. That's fine. You have to catch your flight, yes. Okay, have a safe trip. Okay. See you again. So, um, so what will happen is that um, uh, if, you, uh, if you see carbon depositing, and you can find that during your um, uh, tests, and that is routinely found out, then you just inject steam for a certain period, burn out the carbon, I mean, the, uh, eat out the carbon, gasify the carbon, or CO2, whichever is available, and that's the way to go. So, by reforming means, um, you can actually reform with both steam and uh, carbon dioxide, and that way, your, um, your products are uh, one is to two, one is to two, um, you know, um, uh, CO and H2, that, and that will that will give you direct. That's directly the composition that you need for the uh, methanol. Oh yes, yes, that's right, that's right. So um, uh, the important thing is that if you have all of these gases available, then utilize them. Uh, in the right ratios, and then you get all of this. The advantage of bioreforming is that the sud, uh, carbon deposition is minimized in situ because you already have steam, and then as soon as the carbon is formed, steam takes it away. Okay? And put it in. Which reactions are responsible for coking? Carbon deposition. Ah, okay. So, which reactions are uh, responsible for carbon deposition? That's the, the normal fact of any hydrocarbon decomposition. Any hydrocarbons, when it is raised to a high temperature, it will start depositing carbon. And that is unavoidable. So it is the normal breakage, normal bond breakage, nothing else. Uh, when you are reacting car car methane, uh, deforming methane, you are essentially breaking the bond of the methane so that it can give you another product, right? Um, through a series of mechanism. So some of those carbon will not go anywhere; it will simply deposit. So that's why that's where it comes from. Okay. But the advantage of uh, by reforming as opposed to single steam reforming or single dry reforming is that the carbon uh, carbon deposition is minimized. Okay. Uh, but the the, eh? the but the but the fact is that uh, you get only you get only eighty five percent conversion in a single pass. That's all, and that's a good yield. So you need to recirculate it and then leave it leave leave with it.